Yuma Guruburi and good afternoon everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the National Gallery this afternoon for this very special event featuring Cressida Campbell and Dr Serena Nordhaus in conversation with Fran Kelly. A very warm welcome also to audiences across the country who are joining us online tonight. My name is Heather Whiteley Robertson. I'm the Tim Fairfax Assistant Director for Learning and Digital here at the National Gallery. This evening, I welcomed you in the Ngunnawal greeting Yuma and the Ngambri greeting Guruburi. I thank the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri elders for sharing their beautiful language with us. And I also acknowledge that we meet together today on the, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri country here where the National Gallery stands. I pay respects to all First Nations elders, leaders and artists and particularly also like to acknowledge all First Nations people joining us in the audience tonight. For blind and low vision audiences, I'll now self-describe. I'm a cisgender woman with dark blonde hair. It's tied back tonight. Uh, and I'm wearing oval shaped glasses that are dark brown. And I'm wearing a mid length dress that's got an African print with bright reds and yellows. Tonight's event is held in association with the exhibition Cressida Campbell, which presents a substantial career survey of one of Australia's most significant contemporary artists working in painting and printmaking. Combining keen observation with delicacy of line, Campbell's woodblocks, paintings and prints capture the overlooked beauty of the everyday. Through her views of a working harbour or burnt bushland, an arrangement of nasturtiums or a plate of ripening permesons, she celebrates the transitory moments of life. In celebration of the National Gallery's 40th anniversary this year, we've acquired two of Campbell's major works, Bush Remnants 1986 and a recent work produced this year, Bedroom Nocturne 2022. These works feature in the exhibition and have become a part of the National Art Collection for all Australians. Tonight, artist and curator will discuss these works. This exhibition, Cressida Campbell, is part of the National Gallery's Know My Name initiative launched in 2020 to create gender equity, celebrate the diversity of women artists and enhance understanding of the contribution of women to Australia's cultural life. Our panel this evening includes ABC journalist Fran Kelly, presenter of ABC talk show Frankly, and for more than 15 years, presenter of Radio National's Breakfast. We're also joined on stage by the artist, Cressida Campbell, whose major survey show opened here at the National Gallery in September, and Dr Serena Nordhaus Fairfax, curator of the exhibition. We'll be welcoming your questions throughout the conversation using Slido, an online Q&A platform. If you're at home, click on the Slido link in the right-hand corner of your screen. In the theatre, please ensure that your phone is turned to silent and using the gallery's free Wi-Fi, head to slido.com and enter the code Cressida to submit your questions. The details are just on the screen here on the right. My stage left. <laughs> now I'd like to hand over to Fran Kelly. Thank you, Fran. Thank you very much, Heather. <laughs> and thank you all of you for coming out this afternoon. I would also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, the traditional owners of the land on where we meet, which we meet, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And for those of you joining us online, thank you for joining us. I'd like to extend that respect too to the traditional custodians of the land from which you join us tonight. Before we get started, I will self-describe for our low vision audience and invite both Cressida and Serena to do the same. My name is Fran. I've been a journalist for 35 years. I've got blondish hair, deep set eyes and a ready smile, and I'm wearing a bright red shirt this evening. I've been a radio journalist for much of my life, so you might recognise the voice. I think that about sums me up. Now, Serena, Cressida, you, you go first, Serena. Sure. Uh, so my name's Serena. I'm the curator of Australian prints and drawings. I um, in my sort of midlife. Uh, I've got <laughs> that was tricky. I left that bit out. <laughs> I, uh, I have curly graying hair um, 
and uh, I'm wearing some curatorial black outfit, <laughs> and uh, I think that sums me up. Cressida? I might say Serena is a lot more, she's downplaying herself, she's a raving beauty <laughs> <laughs> with a Flemish face. <laughs> but um, I am a redhead by birth and I've got, uh, I'm 62 years old, have brown eyes that look a little bit almond shaped. I'm wearing a creamy coloured silk Indian top that my sister de brought, designed from India. I'm also wearing a beautiful um, fine old batik scarf and black trousers and black espadrilles. <laughs> <coughs> and she looks a picture. <laughs> I, um, I'm so excited to be here today speaking with Cressida and Serena, the artist and the curator. And for those of you who have been lucky enough to see the exhibition already, you'll know that this is really, truly a collaborative, uh, a collaboration of both. The NGA director, Nick Mitsevich, describes this exhibition as, quote, a journey of beauty. And uh, I think that's an apt description and an epic journey so far, I would say. So much beauty on the walls. In fact, a friend of mine called me recently and she'd just been to Canberra to see the exhibition and she said, I felt like falling to my knees, so overwhelming the wonder of Cressida's work, not just the beauty of it and the skill of it, but the enormity of it and the grandeur and the magnificence of the body of work when seen and experienced as a whole, as we do here at the gallery. The time, the energy, the commitment to the craft the amount of a lifetime committed to giving us such beauty, it really is quite something. 140 works, each of them lovely to gaze upon. It's like being saturated in loveliness, that's how I felt, the loveliness of, of everyday life. That's how I feel about it. A little later, I will invite questions to find out how you feel about it or, or what more you would like to know about it. In fact, as Heather mentioned, send the questions in through the conversation so we can perhaps incorporate them through the conversation as we go along using Slido, the online platform. Um, you know the rest. Put your phone on silent. Please put your phones on silent. And away we go. Uh, Cressida, let's start with you. Do you know how good you are? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, the trouble is if, if you know a lot about the greats, you always know that you're not as good as the greats. So, and that, I mean, everyone's got their own tastes, but in my particular tastes, um, you know, I, I know what I certainly don't think. I know that I'm not as good as the greats. But having said that, um, there's, I know there's an essence in my work that people respond to. And also, I've always had the desire to draw and paint. And I, I do think I'm a bit like a bird of prey. I do think I've been interested in looking very sharply for a long, you know, ever since I was six years old. So, um, and like most serious artists, even though I hate the word serious, I mean, there's probably some very good artists who are frivolous, but <laughs> the greats are obsessed with what they do and uh, keep on doing it. And, um, have to do it. It's not a. It's not a choice. It, the call, you know, it's the cliche. It's a. It is a calling. But um, I've got some. I mean, there are a lot of absolutely amazing artists that have been through the centuries. But um, I think in each century, I don't think there are huge amounts of great artists. It's like you go through museums around the world and you'll 
rushed through a room, because I'm always greedily wanting to see as much as I can in every museum, and there'll be one picture in a room that completely stands out, and that picture, you'll go up to it and it'll all be, always be by an amazing artist, mm. whereas the others aren't you know, nearly as interesting. The, you talked about the obsessiveness. I mean, I've spoken to some of your family members and your friends, the, the people who know you so well, who know your, you best and your work best, um, and some of them have reported being brought to tears by this exhibition, as I say, even though they know your work so well. Um, and I think that was about the, the, the dimension of it and what that says about you and that commitment or obsession, whatever you want to call it. I wonder, did you learn anything or did anything surprise you about your own work as a result of this exhibition and seeing it displayed as it is? Well, partly a lot to do with Serena and a lot of other people who've worked very tirelessly on it. Um, it has come together, you know, much be better than I would have hoped. Betterly, or whatever that word is. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's it has surprised me. It's funny because I'm not one of those people who burst into tears when they see a picture or listen to music. But recently, my sister Nell, who was in the first version of the Rocky Horror Sh Picture Show did a one man, one woman show up in Brisbane and I went up there because I hadn't, because I was a lot younger or reasonably younger than her, I hadn't seen her perform and I actually started crying at the end of the show so for the first time ever I kind of realised what it could be yeah. to be moved like that. Um, I'm really thrilled at the way the show sort of flows, which has a lot to do with Serena, Serena's imagination, even though I had my few little stabs of suggestions. <laughs> and um, We'll come to those. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's, it's been a, a very um, complicated process, but I'm... I'm incredibly touched and f flattered that people seem to be getting so much out of it. It's, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I was saying to an interviewer yesterday, um, who said, I said I don't want to my work to be pretty, and he laughed. He was a very charming man actually, but he he laughed and said, I oh, don't be ridiculous, and I said, no, that's not. I'm not being. There's a big difference between pretty and be and beautiful, and um, pretty is saccharine, and beautiful is you know an Islamic tile, or a Vermeer, or you know a well balanced design, or it's a very different thing. So um, when I try and do a picture to get it as interestingly as possible. I try and get it so that the eye is continually stimulated and uh, sometimes, you know, it's a very subtle picture and sometimes it's bold, but it's not about beauty to me. Is um, it, it can be delicacy or it can be very dramatic, but it's certainly not about uh, a prettiness. Mm. Serena, what makes Cressida's work unique from your perspective as a curator? It's obviously more than just the volume of it, more than the complexity of the process, of the woodcut process. Working so closely with this body of work, how would you describe her talent and her the, spe the specialness? Well, I think I tend to fall back on the word astonishing. I think Cressida is astonishing as a person, as I've um, got to know <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. um, 
but her work is astonishing. I think as a curator, you kind of, I was approaching it as a, you know, a curator of prints and drawings. I didn't, I knew her work to a degree, and I really liked her work, but I approached it as printing. I didn't understand that she's, she's right in between painting and printmaking. I didn't, I've never come across an artist who works in this way. And as you mentioned, this extraordinary technique that she developed back in 1979. There's a sort of like layer upon layer of complexity in it. Um, learning uh, to kind of, like the way that Cressida, I think, sees the world through all these sorts of different lenses, all these analytical ways of looking for things through design, through form, through pattern, through color, her sort of superpowers as a colorist. Like the more I kind of, looked at the work and spoke with her and looked at the ideas, um, the more astonishing it became. And, and what was the, what was it like working with a living contemporary visual artist and how does it differ from the other curatorial, curatorial projects you've worked on? Well, yes, I just finished working on another project um, uh, which is a touring show for, Nime, for Know My Name called Spowers and Sign, which is about two modernist printmakers from the 1930s in Nam in Melbourne. Um, and this was just such a huge contrast because that one I just had to research, look through lots of old newspaper articles, and I had to kind of keep putting my curatorial hat on and, and, and uh, trying to feel my way across the many, many gaps, the many, many missing pieces in the jigsaw. And of course, with Cressida, I could, I could go up and visit her, I could, I could talk to her on the phone. Um, I could, there were no gaps, you know, I could just kind of get all that fresh voice, fresh ideas. I knew also that putting the show together, that I needed to make her happy. You know, so like for Spouse and Sime, I imagine they're ghosts, and I was like, I wanted to do the best for them, and you can only ever hope that you achieve that. But with Cressida, because it, back and forth all the time, when I'd suggest something to her, my aim is to kind of, is, is that I needed you to be happy with it. Um, and sometimes we would disagree on it, or there'd be more suggestions and back and forth. And it just, it's very satisfying to know that you're getting closer and closer to something that makes the artist um, truly happy. And but how did that process go for you, Cressida? I mean, your involvement in it, we'll talk about the, the use of colour and stuff in a moment, but your in involvement with the layout and the organisation, it, it's not chronological, it's thematic, that's a little unusual. I mean, how was, was that okay with you, all those decisions? Did she always make you happy? <laughs> well... <laughs> Um, I was always I'm a bit terrified of the idea of the word curator. <laughs> um, because? Well, I'd, I'd had two sort of retrospective shows in, at the SH Irvine in Sydney in 2008 and um, 2000 and about 14, I think. And for various reasons, the curators had health problems and, or, you know, was a difficult... I virtually curated it. And so... And I'm, like most people and artists, a bit of a control freak. And um, so I was nervous of what Serena might have up her sleeve. <laughs> but um, she... The more we got on, I respected her... Uh, she's very intelligent and sensitive. And um, so the more we got on, the more it developed. And she had ideas that I wouldn't have necessarily put in, like the written pieces. And um, I had I, a few ideas of pictures that she hadn't been necessarily familiar with or thought would have looked good. Um, but it really was a very harmon harmonic or harm harmonious, harmonious um, you know, relationship in the end. And my darling husband, um, clever husband, Warren, who's a photographer and master printer, he did a lot of um, the work, helped photograph a lot of the images again, because a lot of the 
past works had been photographed in before digital in slide form and mm. you know they they he could make them look a lot better um but Serena and I uh, uh, yeah she it was she had a great she's got a great eye and she pulled me when I got a bit sort of I don't know perhaps egocentric or you know wanting something particularly that would stand out she pulled me back a few times and said no I think this is more interesting or which is good because it's a bit like a director in a film or and there are some wonderful touches in the exhibition if you've seen it or you're lucky enough to see it that that I really love I've never seen before like the collection of all your brushes or your empty paint tubes or your um this this color swatches of you know I just love seeing yeah. that evidence of of the artist's life I love that but also I mean you did get a fair bit of say in it in terms of understand you came up with the wall colours for, for the gallery well with each space. Yeah, I must say the I it's funny there was an, a Mar, a Melbourne art fair um, that I exhibited in oh, I think it was two thousand and seventeen or something. And uh, with Sophie Gannon, one of my dealers and as I, I paint on paper, I mean, uh, sorry, I paint, my palette is litho paper. And I started really liking looking at the palettes because they're the exact opposite of the pictures. The pictures are very tightly composed and whereas the palettes look like a sort of, there's a freedom to them. And... So I just thought I, I thought it would make good wrapping paper. I don't know if it has. I know that my card man who makes the cards, he has printed a bit of it, but I don't know if it's sold well. But um, uh, I thought that would look good in the show as a um, in a cabinet, and also in the Melbourne show. I I started collect. I liked the look of all the little paint tubes. Because, because when, I mean, my work is a mixture of printing and painting and drawing. Perhaps we should just, um, without going into great detail, for people yeah. who haven't seen it and don't know that, we all know it's, it's wood blocks, but it's a, it's a drawing and then a carving and then a painting and then a printing yeah. and then a repainting. So you're all those elements. Well, that's why I started thinking, well, maybe I should show people a few paint tubes. Yeah. Because otherwise, when people associate printing, they don't actually think of painting. And so I started collecting the paint tubes and the sable brushes. I, I mean, a lot of printing, as most people might know, is done with rollers and inks and stuff, whereas I paint with watercolour paint with tiny sable brushes. And just on the one block as well, yeah. which is unusual. And um, so I started collecting them and I really liked the look of them. So that's why we put them in that cabinet. And I also put, I listen, I'm chained to the radio like a lot of artists are because... Hence our friendship. <laughs> <laughs> um, because mostly you're solitary and it's a great way of keeping in touch with the world and you know, hearing about people and as a lot of people here would probably know too. And uh, so I put one of my radios in the cabinet. I don't know if anyone actually realises that's why, but um, I've still got... I still use a Sony radio at the moment, but um, I use them so much so they break down. <laughs> um Serena writes in the exhibition catalogue that the exhibition invites questions about how art can bear witness to a life. How has your life impacted your work? Now, that's a big question because, of course, life impacts work. But, for instance, you know, I know you painted throughout the death of your first husband, Peter, um, and exhibited later after his death. You know, can we, could we see the, the loss and sorrow in your work? Did it... 
did it mark a change in any way? Um, do you think? I definitely think. I mean, as you go through life, you you go through different changes, and it affects um, just as we all do. It affects different behaviours, and so some of the pictures. When I started off, they were very bold and they had a assets that some of the later ones may not have, but the later ones may have intricacies that the earlier ones didn't have. But um, someone gave me some flannel flowers when Peter was... He, died, he was dying at home and it was a very sad, tragic experience. And, but someone gave me some flannel flowers and um, I was drawing them in the studio and I wanted them to look like they were actually in real life against the sky. Because I loved the idea of, you know, in a, not that I've been to the Middle East, but those Islamic domes mm. with white stars or silver stars on them looking up against the blue. And I thought that reminded me of the flannel flowers. So um, I drew them first and then he, he loved the drawing and then I painted them. And so that was an example. And then when he um, died, I spent a lot of time lying on this sofa, drinking probably far too many gin and tonics, looking into the reflection of the window. And the, there happened to be three Japanese um, rice-papered lights that reflected down into the window and I thought that would be a good composition and I think for some reason the, the work became a little bit more um, moody and then my sister Nell used to live in the Northern Hemisphere and go to a lot of museums and she gave me a catalogue of, uh, it was called Rooms with a View, and it was from a show at the National Gallery in London, and there were all these wonderful 18th century paintings of, uh, a lot of them were in places like Germany, Copenhagen, um, Denmark, I mean, Sweden, places I hadn't been to, and so I went on a bit of a, I took her on what you'd call a, I called it a Kunst tour. Because Kunst, if you didn't know, is German for art. And um, we started off in Hamburg and went to Berlin and then um, Munich and then Vienna. And it was incredibly inspiring because I saw all these artists' work that I'd never seen. And so I then started sort of going into a few getting influenced by a few interiors. There's an, an amazing artist called Kersting who does rather mysterious little interiors. Of, he did a great portrait of Caspar David Friedrich painting in his, in his studio. And so my work went into a more slightly moody feel, but I think it's going to get back I'm going, I want to do a series of lichen. Let me stop you there because I, I, I want to get to the interiors because, you know, there's some wonderful interiors in the exhibition. But um, I noticed that uh, Nairi has asked, when you see so much beauty everywhere, how do you choose? How do you stop from getting overwhelmed by all the things you want to paint? Is that, is that a problem for well, you? Well, the funny thing is, um, I can see... And most, the, the great thing is, I am a bit of a slave to my eyes, which is... You see beauty in the lichen. Well, beauty, lichen is beautiful. I mean, that's a definite um, <laughs> thing that's beautiful. I must say once, for whatever reason, I was getting my mother's house painted, and the, that was painted by these very nice Korean painters, but to my absolute horror, I went over there and they'd scrubbed all the lichen off her roof and I nearly had a heart attack <laughs> and um, anyway 
I saw a lot of wonderful lichen in Cambodia years ago and I've done one, there's a one picture of lichen in this show, but it's exquisite. But, uh, and apparently it only grows if it's a, not a very polluted area, which is interesting. But, um, but generally, uh, are you seeing inspiration? Well, I see, everywhere? I see, yes. I mean, the thing is, you can see it in um, design. You can see in a, I did a bit of a, had to do a speech on opening night, and I, they asked me to do a PowerPoint presentation, which I was showing them how you could actually see interesting design in a tangles of PowerPoints under your desk. And I mean, <laughs> Practically everything has an interesting design, particularly things that have to work, like knives and boats and... I mean, nature is the most, to me, the most beautiful because it's sort of... you can't... it's so magical, the formation of it. But having said that, um, interiors often you can make an interior that looks pretty dreary look a lot better. A lot better. You can make a fishbone look good, <laughs> I mean... Well, they have a, a very good design. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See? Um, and, 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 Serena, I know you've commented about that, Cressida's capacity to make a compost bin or a fishbone or the remnants of a meal look beautiful. But back to the interiors, um, as part of the celebrations for the 40th anniversary of the gallery, the National Gallery, um, the gallery purchased Bedroom Nocturne. Can you tell us about why you, ch here it is, why you chose this work? Uh, yes, well, this is, you know, Cressida has been working in the round format, so the Tondo format, since about 2018, and that's sort of another sort of experimental layer to her practice. And uh, in the visits that I had, she was kind of sending me little snaps back and forth of the works that she was working on. This one was done this year towards a solo show uh, Cressida had in July at Philip Bacon Galleries in Mianjin in Brisbane. And I, out of all of them, I mean, they were all amazing and I loved them all, but this one really captured something to me. And I think you, we had a conversation about, you were saying it was one of the most intimate works that you'd made because obviously it's your bedroom. Yeah. Uh, which is a fairly private space for all of us. And for me, you know, with my little curatorial hat on at the back of my head, um, I was thinking about how, you know, like the, the bed, the unmade bed, um, is something that has been visited through art history for, like, for centuries, you know, Delacroix, for example, through to Tracy Emin in all sorts of different ways and for all sorts of different reasons. So it had that really beautiful lineage um, and I loved that, you know, in this very special space, you had a lot of works by other artists that you've collected that are obviously really important to you because you, you keep them in, in the space. Um, and what surprised me, there was a lot of First Nations artists that you collected. Yeah. So the bark, the Wangina bark by Lily Karadada, the wonderful yam dreaming mm, work yeah. by Jarara Wanamara, a little bit of the Queenie Mackenzie print that you can see there. There's a Japanese, some of the Yukio prints that you've collected. There's a new tomorrow. There's a little Bonar um, dry point from a book. It's of his wife, Mart, looking out a window. And uh, there's a little corner of a, another um, indigenous work kind of poking in. It's funny because when my sister and mother, years ago my sister Nell and my mother had a terrible car accident in on the way to Uluru, which was then called Ayers Rock. And my other sister and I went up and got them, collected them, and they were very badly injured. And uh, I bought that little picture in the, um, art, the one art gallery there then and uh, it's funny how these things still keep a good you know appear in other pictures that's interesting isn't it because i mean speaking of you know art bearing witness to your life bedroom nocturne it's it invites us into your house into your bedroom you know you're i would say you're a fairly private person but here we are 
in your bedroom. Um, yeah. how, how do you how do you decide what to let us see, and how careful are you about that? Well, actually, I mean, in that when I saw that crumpled sheet and there's some more Sally Campbell textiles. <laughs> I'm sounding That's like another Sally's, Sally's yeah. um, PR agent. Um, I just loved the look of all the crumples and I, I've never, I've actually hardly ever painted drapery, which you start, when you start painting it, you realise why the in the Renaissance era they forced the, you know, apprentices to learn how to paint drapery because it's actually very difficult ah, yeah. and uh, because it's like a person you've got to have flesh on it, its bones. My, mo my mother always used to say painting people with hats is difficult because you've got to make the hat look like it's sitting on the head just like if, a, if you've got a ship in the ocean you don't want the ship to just look like it's you know solid on the ocean. Anyway, I, I loved the, um, I just liked all the colours and the mood. Even though Warren does share the bed, I quite liked the, you wouldn't know whether it was just one person's bed or not. And also you think who's left the bed, has some, is someone just about to get into it? I've always been a, not the most tidy bed keeper, but... Um, I just like the whole mood of it, and I also quite liked. Uh, I've always been someone who moves slowly with the technical times, unlike Warren, who is a, sort of Mr. Fast Man with the digital world. But if you peer into it, there's a landline telephone that I still use, and then there's the iPhone, and then there's an alarm clock, and a glass of water and it's just got and an electric cord which always is often a good device in a composition it's an intimate picture but it's um and i like the different pictures i like the uh that industrial pictures interesting with the black and white mm. of the indigenous and i love the queenie mackenzie so it was it just worked as a composition, really. It's, uh, I think at this point we should actually pay tribute to Warren, your husband, Warren Macris, because if you don't know, he is a technical whiz. In fact, he created the amazing wallpaper at the ent entrance to the exhibition, which is just a phenomenal work of art in itself, yeah. isn't it, really? Um, Serena, the exhibition has been commissioned as part of the gallery's Know My Name Gender Equity Initiative. Obviously, Cresta is a leading Australian female artist. Do you, would you describe her work as female in its subject or indeed feminist in its subject? Mm. I think perhaps traditionally women have focused more on domestic settings than, than men in, in art history for various reasons um, over the time. Um, I guess something that I learnt from putting this together with Cressida is that I had only known uh, mainly the sort of still life and interior works, whereas, you know, there are a lot of images that are around the working harbour, uh, there are a lot of industrial images that you've still managed to make incredibly alluring and, uh, and reveal themselves to me in a different sort of a way. So for me, I think the fact that Crossed actually works across so many genres that I hadn't realised, you know, across still life, self-portraiture, the interiors, landscape. That was a real revelation as well, and that's something I've really enjoyed when I've talked with, with audiences and with people who are guiding in the exhibition as well, um, that she's... that there is This work is about her life, but your life isn't only in your home or in that's your it. garden. It's out around the harbour. It's out on walks that you used to do with your mum mm. um, or with your family. So, so it, it Chris, extends. Do you describe your, would you describe yourself as your work as feminist art? Is that ever a description you've used? Um, no, I've never really thought of 
I was brought up in a family, luck, luck, very lucky, to be brought up in a family that um, didn't lay any, my both, my brilliant father and brilliant mother didn't sort of lay any um, expectations on any of us. If we were interested in something, they'd encourage it. But if we weren't, um, you know, I mean, I was so hopeless at music, I was given a ruler to play instead of a recorder. <laughs> so that mum didn't do that, but... Um, you the, got the message. <laughs> the rather unpleasant music teacher did. But um, so even... And also my, both my parents were very... Uh, my mother had gone to art school, Dobe, taught by Dobell. Dobell wanted to do a portrait of her. She, she was a, a raving beauty, but as well as that, she was quite a net tear away, and she went off and cut all her hair off like Greta Garbo, and then he didn't want to... He, he was the um, conservative. He didn't want to paint her then. And uh, my father was not a chauvinist at all. So my brother was brought up with three pretty, you know, lively, well, four with mum, very lively girls. And he was very unconventional. He was a brilliant scientist, tragically died recently. But um, he was one of the people that, if, he, if it wasn't for his PhD, we wouldn't have 60% of the uh, solar pa panels in the world. So he was pretty amazing. But um, so when it comes to feminism, I just did what I wanted to do. I didn't have to be one of those people who had to push against their upbringing. The only... The only thing that I would say is that when I was a young artist, I mean, I'm now 62, so I went to art school when I was 16, there were a lot of chauvinistic art teachers, and most of them were men, male painters, and they mostly wanted to paint in the style or sculpt in the... They wanted you to do what they did, which... That was irritating. So um, I don't know if you, whether that makes me a feminist, but I just went and did what I wanted to do, to do quietly. And I definitely think now um, the world is... I mean, it's so much more open for women artists of all, of all types, even though I was lucky in that People appreciated my work and, you know, I, I started off getting very modest prices, but gradually, after seven years on the dole, um, you know, I could manage to support myself. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a strange... I, and some of my work subjects were interiors and some of them were totally different subjects. Um, I mean, you could look at the famous Italian painter called Mirandi, who most of his fame is, comes from his minimalist um, still lives. But he was a man. Yes. And he also did some wonderful, as a probably most of you know, landscapes, but I mean, Matisse did so many um, incredible still lives and he was a man. It, it's more, I think it's more the pressure, um, comes from the pressure that's put on the person by their parents or the school they go to or whether they feel they have to be grow up as you know a feminist or so you raised a few things then about you know yes you write, you paint interiors but you know so did Matisse do still lives etc Serena when 
choosing Cressida for this blockbuster exhibition, um, I mean, obviously she's a highly collected artist, but not t not necessarily highly collected by our institutions, by some of our major artist art institutions. For instance, the NGV, I think, doesn't hold a Cressida. What does that say about Cressida's work, do you think, and our art establishment, if anything? Well, I think... I think she has been well collected by the Art Gallery of New South Wales and their remit is really, you know, the different states do tend to focus on the artists of the state. Of their state. Um, so we did borrow a lot of really amazing key works um, from them. And that there are a number of regional institutions that were borrowed up and down the East Coast predominantly. And it's kind of like piecing it all together in that, you know, you were mainly exhibiting in Sydney, then exhibiting in Brisbane, a little bit in Melbourne. I think part of the trickiness perhaps is, is your unique position between painting and printmaking? I think you're right. Because, yeah. you know, inside institutions, you have different curators who look after different you areas. You do print and paper. So and I do works on paper. So I, we had some really beautiful works on paper, but perhaps someone might have come to us and said, oh, but it's a painting. So therefore, it will go to a different curator and they'd be like, oh, no, it's a print. So it comes, you know, like back and forth. And no one's really... No, no one has liked to pigeon... I haven't been easy to pigeonhole. Yeah. And I was really thrilled when Serena encouraged for the gallery to purchase the woodblock of the Nocturne because it's definitely a combination of painting and printing my work because the, the painting part, the woodblock, the texture that comes off when the print comes off is like a fresco. And with the prints, the... Um, it's more like a watery colour, delicate, more like a Japanese print, even though it's not made with um, multi-blocks. But um, I also have to say, as everyone knows, there are fashions in art. And uh, when I was younger working, there were... Uh, you know, there were fashions of, that were being collected by galleries and I wasn't in that fashion, as well as that the artist Margaret Olley, who was at that stage quite a bit older than I was, she was actually buying um, art, young artists' work and donating them to regional galleries and... I just want to ask you a bit more about that because we, we really do need to, to get to questions in a moment. But mm. just on that notion of the fashion, how do you feel about being so in demand by private collectors, which, which you are, but, but up until perhaps more recently, not by so much by some galleries? Obviously, Gallery of New South Wales, thank Margaret Olley and others, because it means most, a lot of your works aren't seen by most of us. Does that pain well. you? <laughs> Yeah, it is unfortunate, but um, it's the same with the, a lot of artists. I mean, even if you give, if you go around the world and you want to see some of the best artists, there you've often got to just go. You can see one in a whole yeah. city. So it's, and also sadly, um, different g galleries have had opportunities to buy wonderful um, works at different times and they, because of fashions, they haven't done it. I mean, I think it was the early 1900s, the Art Gallery of New South Wales had the opportunity to buy a whole lot of Impressionists' work at very reasonable prices and instead they bought rather dull, you know, Victorian Australian pieces. Mm. So it it's a complicated thing and I've always thought that the only thing that sorts out good and bad work is time. And, and even that might be a strange thing because, I mean, maybe even in 200 years, a great artist like Chardin, his, his work might have gone out of fashion. I mean, it, it is really um, tricky in that way. 
I'm going to move to questions now, but just before I do, I think it's perfect time to quote the art critic John MacDonald, who wrote in the SMH Sydney Morning Herald recently, if ever there was an exhibition to silence the doubters and vanquish the crit critics, this is it. And more than that, if ever there was a chance to show everybody a range of your work throughout your career, this is it. So thank God for the National Gallery of Australia and for this <laughs> exhibition, I think. <laughs> so let's, there's been some fantastic questions coming in. Um, and just on the notion of, you know, New South Wales Gallery collecting a lot of Cressidas, for instance, because you're from Sydney, um, somebody asked, do you consider yourself a Sydney artist? Does location define your perspective? Um, well, when I was in the period when I was... I grew up in Greenwich and it was near the Shell Terminal. And I do like industrial um, shapes because they can be very decorative. And uh, also my father had died when I was 21 and mum was only 59 and we used to go, she would come as my drawing companion because if you're drawing on your own outside, often you get a bit spooked by, you know, someone... Strangers. Yeah. <laughs> You, you don't want Ivan Milat coming up behind you and no, you don't. hitting you on the head or something. <laughs> so even though Mum wasn't exactly, you know, a bodyguard, she'd be sitting reading the paper with some chicken sandwiches next to me. But but I drew a lot of subjects around Gore Bay and um, so th that is a very Sydney area. But as far as... Um, and the bush parts. I'd love to do m more bush pictures, but I tend to only like doing them if I can be private doing them. So we, I was living um, with Peter, my first husband, in an old um, Walter Burley Griffin house, um, subletting it from a friend in um, Avalon. And luckily the bush was all around us and so it was fantastic because I just had the bush there as a, um, like a, as a backdrop, an interior. I'm going to move. Th we're going to run out of time very quickly, so let me let's see if we can move through a couple. Um, Serena, Barbara asks, how long did it take to bring the exhibition together? So a, a, a sort of a survey of of an of a artist's life like this, when lots in private collections, was that particularly challenging? And how long did it take you? Uh, yeah, and it was it was tricky. Um, I think I was asked to start working on this project early last year, uh, but as we know, pandemic, and we weren't able to travel, so we couldn't go out to find all the works in people's homes. So hence, there was a lot of reliance on the conversations with Cressida and Warren. Of course, was really helpful with that too, providing lots of prints of images and the beautiful book that Cressida had made with Peter back in two thousand and eight. And, and looking through archives and then working with Cressida's different dealers to kind of track down works. And that became trickier and trickier, a bit of a detective story over time, I think. You know, I had yeah. um, your wonderful friend <coughs> Brett Stone who used to work with Rex Owen, looking through the Rex Owen archives <laughs> before the library shut down um, up in Sydney and trying to see what was penciled on the back of system cards. We had the wonderful Lachlan Henderson at Philip Basin Galleries facilitating and tracking mm. it all down. So it's a real, it took a um, long time. It's a real detective work, isn't it? Yeah. We couldn't find everything that, you know, we were looking... I mean, we had so much to choose from, but... It, just, just briefly on that, Krista, do you feel like... I mean, you couldn't find everything, but do you feel like this retrospective, this survey of your work reflects the entirety of your work, or is there one piece missing that you, you would love to have had? It's pretty good. I mean... It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. There was one picture that we wanted because I had a few... I had about three exhibitions with Angela Neville, who's a very interesting dealer in London. And uh, she sold some... The, sh the shows went very well there and then for various reasons. She, she did them with Philip Bacon and for various reasons we stopped. But there was a white Angophora picture that um, I did it when I was staying up at Avalon and we really wanted that. And in the end, it was finally tracked down, but the woman 
just didn't want to lend it. She didn't see any point. I don't... I mean, it is a bit... to live without it, Cressida. Let's face it. <laughs> it's a long... I mean, it's a big deal when you're sending pictures overseas. For sure. That's yeah. the thing. Um, Cressida, this is the first question that came in tonight from Jen. It's been sitting here for, for a while on the screen. But I love it. How do you feel when you're in creative mode? Um, I actually feel quite relaxed. I think... I know the... It's a rather overused term, but I think it really is my meditation. Um, I mean, I'm so... If it's going well, doesn't mean it's easy, but if it's going well, um, it's... It's very sort of... It's a puzzle. It's like... Um, I've always thought it's like being a... My brother once said to me when I said, oh, God, I'm, I'm probably going to get some kind of terrible disease of, you know, dementia soon because I'm doing the same thing all the time. And he said, no, you're not, because every day you, you're actually um, trying to discover something else in the, in the work. And it is like disco uh, discovering a puzzle or, you know, finding... Um, the right colours. It's continually interesting. Sometimes uh, the most difficult part is actually the printing because different paints are absorbed by the water at different times and so suddenly part of the picture will all start blurring and the other part will stick. So that is actually not meditative of it at all. <laughs> but um, but uh, it's certainly, it, it, in 25, uh, how many of years I've been doing this, it's never um, become easy. So, and that's a good thing, because if it had... Just on that, the technical question Craig has asked, the colour tones of the blocks seem more muted than the vibrant tones of the prints. Which best represents your vision? Yeah, that's interesting. It, I don't know why, but the um, with the prints, if if I paint after I've printed it, first of all, the I, I painted the watercolor paint on the blocks very thickly, so it's not like fine watercolor painting in a you know that you'll see in an old well or any watercolor. It's thick. It's in layers. So when it's actually printed, it's almost sunk into the paper. So which is a, another good thing is that unless someone puts it right opposite a brilliantly light window, it very rarely fades. But if I paint, after it's, I've done the print, if I then paint with the same colour onto the paper, it doesn't have the um, luminousy of the printed watercolour, which I've never known why. Um, but as far as the blocks go, I know what you mean by them not being quite as bright, but I love... To me, it's a bit like an old Persian rug. I do like that fresco-y feel, and sometimes they've got a density that the prints don't have. So it's a... Half, you know, some some of them to me work better than others, and some of them, you know, it's a personal taste. And it's a lovely thing in the exhibition. Speaking to the curator now, to have the uh, the example of the block next to the painting is a, a a good thing to be able to experience that. Yeah, it was nice to. Um, I thought of them as little reunions because I know. Yeah. The, I don't know if they're ever really ever sold to no. the same owners. No, they aren't, which is interesting. It's, um, yeah, I think that people do definitely either prefer the, you know, the print or the block. Perhaps so, we'll do a survey after. 
<laughs> because we are out of time now. So I would just like to say, honestly, what a fabulous honour it has been to oh. in interview you, Cressida, and you, Serena. Thank you. This exhibition, if you haven't seen it yet, for our on-site audience, you can get a chance to see it now. The gallery will be open until 7.30 tonight. I do encourage you to stay and take a close look because it's beautiful. Cressida's work is so beautiful. The gallery shop is open too. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the, uh, the exhibition publication, which Cressida and Warren, I know, and of course Serena, but worked so intensely on, it is a work of art in itself, um, as are the coffee mugs, if I do say so. I purchased them myself. <laughs> um, but for our audience online, thank you very much for joining us. It's been wonderful to have your, your company. Uh, the exhibition is on until... The 19th of February. So if you do get a chance to come down to Sydney and see it, really, it's absolutely worth... Oh, to Canberra, where am I? <laughs> it is absolutely worth it. This is the National Gallery of Australia. It's a wonderful thing. Could you please thank Serena Nordhaus, Fairhouse, Fairfax, and Cressida Campbell. And you. Um, thank you, you very much,